Hi, and welcome back to TED Climate, a podcast from the TED Audio Collective. I'm your host, Dan Cortler, and today we're going to be talking about our favorite topic, ourselves. Obviously, humans have had an extreme impact on our planet. I mean, that's pretty much what this whole podcast is about. In fact, the effect our species has had on Earth is so extreme that scientists have proposed we're living in a new geological era defined by human behavior. Let's dig into exactly what that means. Imagine aliens land on the planet a million years from now and look back into our geologic record. What will these curious searchers find about us? Well, they'll probably find what geologists, scientists, and other experts are increasingly calling the Anthropocene. The impacts that we humans make have become so pervasive, so profound, and so permanent that some geologists argue we merit our own epoch. This means a new unit in the geologic timescale. So, for example, other epochs include the Pleistocene, an icy era that saw the evolution of modern humans. Or there's the Eocene, more than 34 million years ago, a hothouse time during which the continents drifted into where they are now. So, if the Anthropocene is a new epoch marked by mankind, that means the effect of modern humans may be on par with the glaciers behind various ice ages. Or as impactful as the asteroid that doomed most of the dinosaurs. But, you know, the dinosaurs didn't make their own asteroid. So what will the record say about modern humans' impact on the planet? It doesn't rely on things that may seem most obvious to us today, like sprawling cities. Even New York or Shanghai may prove hard to find buried in the rocks a million years from now. But changes in climate or fossils found in the rock record help distinguish these epochs and allow geologists to tell deep time. But humans have put new things into the world, things that never existed on Earth before, like plutonium and plastics and pizza. In fact, the geologists known as stratigraphers who determine the geologic timescale have proposed a start date for the Anthropocene around 1950. That's when people started um, blowing up nuclear bombs all over the place and scattering novel elements to the winds. Those elements will last in the rock record, even in our bones and our teeth, for millions of years. And in just 50 years, we've made at least 8 billion metric tons of plastic, enough to cover the entire world in a thin film. You'll see the before and after of farming, fishing, and forestry in the rock record as well. Because it's those kinds of activities that are causing unique species of plants and animals to die out. This die-off started perhaps more than 40,000 years ago. That was when humanity spread out of Africa and reached places like Australia, kicking off the disappearance of those big, lovable, edible animals like the woolly mammoth. This is true of Europe and Asia as well as North and South America. You know, for a species that has only roamed the planet for a few hundred thousand years... Homo sapiens have had a big impact on the future fossil record. That also means that even if people were to disappear tomorrow, evolution would continue to be driven by our choices to date. We're making a new homogenous world of certain favored plants and animals like corn and rats. But it's a world that's not as resilient as the one that it replaces. As the fossil record shows, a diversity of plants and animals allow for unique pairings of flora and fauna that respond to environmental changes and can even thrive after an apocalypse. This goes for people too. If the microscopic plants of the ocean suffer as a result of too much carbon dioxide, for example, we would lose the source of as much as half of the oxygen we need to breathe. And then there's that smudge in future rocks. People's penchant for burning coal and oil and natural gas has spread tiny bits of soot all over the planet. That smudge corresponds with a meteoric rise in the amount of carbon dioxide in the air. Similar soot can actually still be found in ancient rocks from the volcanic fires of 66 million years ago. It's a record of the cataclysm touched off by an asteroid at the end of the late Cretaceous period. So odds are our soot will still be here 66 million years from now. Easy enough to find for any aliens who care to look. Of course, there is an important difference between us and an asteroid. A space rock has no choice but to follow gravity. We can choose to do differently. And if we do, there might still be some kind of human civilization thousands or even millions of years from now. Not a bad record to hope for. So yeah, we have certainly left our mark on the planet. And let's be honest, it's not the best mark. Unless we make some real changes, countless ecosystems will be damaged beyond repair. Oh, and also humanity will be doomed. 
if you care about that sort of thing. And we do. I do. Like I said, even if we all disappeared tomorrow, our choices would continue to impact the planet. How, you ask? Well, let's find out. What would actually happen if every human on Earth suddenly disappeared? Would the Earth restore its balance? Well, with no one maintaining them, some of our creations backfire immediately. Just hours after we disappear, oil refineries start to malfunction, producing month-long blazes at plants like the ones in Western India, the Southern United States, and South Korea. And in underground rail systems, like those in London, Moscow, and New York, hundreds of drainage pumps are suddenly abandoned, flooding the tunnels in just three days. By the end of that first week, most emergency generators have shut down. And once the fires have gone out, the Earth goes dark for the first time in centuries. After the catastrophic first month, changes start to come more gradually. Within 20 years, sidewalks have been torn apart by weeds and tree roots. And around this time, flooded tunnels erode the streets above into urban rivers. In temperate climates, the cycle of seasons freezes and thaws these waterways back and forth, cracking pavements and concrete foundations. Leaking pipes cause the same reaction in concrete buildings. And within 200 winters, most skyscrapers buckle and tumble down. In cities built in river deltas like Houston, these buildings will eventually wash away completely, filling nearby tributaries with crushed concrete. Rural and suburban areas decay more slowly, but in largely unsurprising ways. Leaks, mold, bug, and rodent infestations, all of the usual enemies of the homeowner, now go uncontested. Within just 75 years, most houses supporting beams have rotted and sagged, and the resulting collapsed heap is now home to local rodents and lizards. But in this post-human world, local has a new meaning. Our cities are full of imported plants, which now run wild across their adopted homes. Water hyacinths coat the waterways of Shanghai in a thick green carpet. Poisonous giant hogweeds overgrow the banks of the London's Thames River. And Chinese ailanthus trees burst through New York City streets. And as sunken skyscrapers add crumbled concrete to the new forest floor, the soil acidity plummets potentially allowing new plant life to thrive. This post-human biodiversity extends into the animal kingdom, too. Animals follow the unchecked spread of native and non-native plants, venturing into new habitats with the help of our leftover bridges. In general, our infrastructure saves some creatures and dooms others. Cockroaches, unfortunately, continue to thrive in their native tropical habitats. But without our heating systems, their urban cousins likely freeze and die out in just two winters. And most domesticated animals are unable to survive without us, save for a handful of resourceful pigs, dogs, and the most feral of our house cats. Conversely, the reduced light pollution saves over a billion birds each year, whose migrations were previously disrupted by blinking communication tower lights and high-tension wires. And mosquitoes multiply endlessly in one of their favorite man-made nurseries, rubber tires, which last for almost a thousand years. Gross. As fauna and flora flourish, Earth's climate slowly recovers from millennia of human impact. Within 35,000 years, the plant cycle removes the last traces of lead left by the Industrial Revolution from Earth's soil. It may take up to 65,000 years beyond that for CO2 to return to pre-human levels. But even after several million years, humanity's legacy lives on. Carved in unyielding granite, America's Mount Rushmore survives for 7.2 million years. The chemical composition of our bronze sculptures also keeps them recognizable for over 10 million. And buried deep, deep underground, the remnants of cities built on floodplains have been preserved in time as a kind of techno-fossil. Eventually, these traces too will be wiped from the planet's surface. Humanity hasn't always been here, and we won't be here forever. But by investigating the world without us, perhaps we can learn more about the world we live in now. Oh, humans, we are a destructive creature, aren't we? But you know what they say about great power and great responsibility. We can choose to change the way we live. We can think more about what we take from the earth and what we put into it. I mean, how cool would it be if humanity wasn't like a parasite on the planet and actually lived in harmony with it? I actually do think that's possible. Thanks for listening. Tune back in next week for more on our impact and how we can change climate change. You can also get involved by joining Countdown, TED's global initiative to accelerate solutions to the climate crisis in collaboration with future stewards. Find out more at countdown.ted.com. 
Ted Climate is produced and edited by Sheena Ozaki, mixed by Sam Baer, and hosted by me, Dan Cortler. This episode adapted two lessons originally produced in animated form by the TED-Ed team. How Long Will Human Impacts Last? was written by David Biello and fact-checked by Francisco Diaz. And What Would Happen If Every Human Suddenly Disappeared? was written by me and fact-checked by Brian Gutierrez. Both pieces were produced with editorial support from Alex Rosenthal. And special thanks to Gertichello, Stephanie Lowe, Michelle Quint, Ben Ben Chang, and Anna Phelan. 